I'm co-founding partner and uh, director of research at Capos Capital, which is a NASA management company. We're not discretionary. I'm Italian, so I know that emotions take over. I'm somebody who uses statistical methods to do investment. They go, oh my God, that must be the most boring thing on the planet. There is overwhelming evidence that the best decisions are made based on a lot of information, a lot of data. I'm, I'm a weird guy, I'm now almost 60, and I still love the idea of using statistics to evaluate what people say. Mm -hmm. Right now, what are your job duties? A lot of things. <laughs> Technically, I am the director of research, which means in a job like mine to interact with a lot of researchers and so evaluate what they're looking at, evaluate their new ideas for new strategies, and eventually sign off so that those ideas become actual trading strategies. And we use those trading strategies to manage money for our clients, for our investors. As a co-founding partner, I'm involved in almost every other decision for, uh, to run the firm, management, hiring, and many other things. But I would say definitely my background is more as a, an ex-academic is supervising research and, and working on our strategies. What is a trading strategy? A trading strategy is essentially, at least for what we do, is any idea where you say, okay, there are some securities that you can trade and those securities can be the most obvious ones to anybody like trading stocks, uh, so shares of a company, to trading financial deriv derivatives, so say futures contracts, forwards, options, swaptions, and so on. What we do here, we say anybody on our research team is free to come up with any idea and say, for instance, oh, I think at this particular time of the month, uh, there are interesting opportunities for trading this particular asset, this particular securities, or this group of assets. And so what we do is we evaluate whether that is really an interesting idea. Now, in practice, in a systematic or quantitative business like ours, when I say evaluate, what does that mean? So in our industry, you know, the big difference from an intellectual point of view is the difference between being quantitative the way we are and being instead a discretionary manager. So a quantitative manager like us will be somebody who says, okay, you suggested that maybe on, I'm just gonna make it up, say on a month end, it's a good idea to look at performance of different markets and then readjust your portfolio based on what you have seen over the last few weeks. Now, to verify, to validate whether that is true, what we will do is we'll say, okay, let's look at 20, 30 years worth of historical data, and let's try to see what would have happened historically if we used that idea. So you try to find empirical evidence that supports what, what you're trying to think, what you're trying to suggest. Discretionary managers tend to be a little bit more, and here I'm being a bit extreme, uh, but hopefully still fair. Discretionary managers tend to be a bit more like listen, the world changes every day, you can't really look at historical data. They tend to go more into, I think that given the recent monetary policy that the Fed is following, we should do this. And so they still trade securities, but they don't trade them based on strict statistical rules, if you want. So you are not discretionary? We're not discretionary. The reason why we're not, the main reason why I'm not, for sure, is that I'm Italian, so I know that emotions take over <laughs> in many aspects of life, definitely in investment management, I would say there is plenty of research that shows that we are all overcome by emotion, especially during stressful times. And guess what? If you're managing money, every day is, stressful, is, is, is a stressful day, right? The idea behind being a quantitative, being non-discretionary, is that you can be extremely creative but you can be creative. Your creativity is mostly when you do your research. It's not when you execute your trades. When I work with my team, what we do is we'll say, okay, here's an interesting idea. And everybody gets excited and then we look at the data and we try to refine it. And once we have done our research, we say, okay, 
based on what we have seen, based on being very careful about the way we use the data and not trying to do things that are, that are not really there, right? Hey, but based on what we have learned, those are our trading rules. And then you stick to those. You're not allowed to come in and basically say, ah, you know, I think that today is a different day, or uh, I'm really nervous about this, forget what we have seen, because we feel that that is the most dangerous aspects of human nature, this, this tendency to override what you really learn from years or from many data or from a more scientific approach. And by the way, this is not something that we came out with out of the blue. There are fascinating papers that talk about discretionary versus systematic decision making, even in the medical field. And I, I wish that everybody read those papers because, you know, all of us often in life face uh, times when you have to make difficult decisions and you you go to the experts and there is I'm not telling people now not to go to the doctor of course but 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 there is overwhelming evidence that the best decisions are made based on a lot of information a lot of data and filtering useful information out of the data rather than gut feeling or personal interaction you know don't get me wrong personal interaction is extremely useful but people who think that they make good decisions because of their own feelings or their own expertise on something very often don't really add value i know this is a very complicated concept for people to digest and very often we as quants are perceived as geeks, boring, and I, but the reality is that I think that quantitative research can be fascinating. And it's even more fascinating when you have to defend it because of course everybody's always ready to challenge you and say, you can't really learn from historical data, the world is always changing. And I, but that to me is the same as saying, well, the world is always changing, so there is nothing that can explain what we see. And that, to me, to me, is too dismissive. I think that if you are a good student of statistical methods, and if you're a good researcher, if you're critical, if you don't have biases in your mind, and if you know how to do research in an intelligent way, you can learn a lot from being a systematic researcher. Tell some secret about your profession that many outsiders would find surprising. Well, I would say the most obvious answer to that would be that it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> I used to joke that, say, you know, when I, when I started my career as, as a quant investment manager, so managing, uh, especially when I was at Goldman, we ended up managing these very large hedge funds. And my wife and I would go to parties and people would say, oh, what do you do? And I would say, oh, I'm a, I'm a hedge fund manager. And everybody would get so excited. And then when I revealed that I was a quantitative hedge manager, hedge fund manager, they just switch and talk to my wife about yoga and all this. Because, because as a quant, you don't really have what we call war stories. Like, you know, when people are at the party and they're drinking on it, they love to talk about, I don't know, oh, uh, what do you think of, I don't know, um, Apple, or what do you think of the stock? If you're a quant, you say, eh, well, guess what? I have 6,000 stocks in my, in my portfolio. <laughs> and, and with this, by the way, I don't mean we don't have a clue, you know. Uh, of course we do. We look at many different factors and that's how we choose our portfolio. In fact, we happen to believe that that tiny little piece of information that some people think is so relevant about Apple is, is just a curiosity, right? So I would say that's the thing, that this is a job that can be super exciting, but if you told people, I'm somebody who uses statistical methods to do investment, they go, oh my God, that must be the most boring thing on the planet. And it's also fun to try to explain why there's the opposite to a lot of people. One thing that you thought would be impossible, but it turned out to be possible and successful? If I answer as a statistician, I'm going to say, no, I never say that anything is impossible because, you know, there is maybe a very slim probability of even extreme events. But yeah, definitely, if somebody had told me when I came to the U.S. 
to do my PhD. Somebody told it told me that 15 years later I would be a partner at Goldman Sachs, or 20 years later I would have my own asset management firm. I would have laughed. If nothing else, also because I remember when I went to Chicago, one thing that I always knew I liked was statistics and econometrics. I can't say that I also knew I was going to do finance. That was a bit more what happened, and, and, and again, this is something crucial, in my opinion, in everybody's life, is being lucky to meet somebody who is going to be your mentor, your inspiration. To me, that happened twice, at, I would say at least twice, and, but you know, when I was in Italy, when I was about to finish college, I took my class in econometrics and that that professor is actually the one who first mentioned to me the idea of going abroad to study because I never even dreamed of doing that. When I went to Chicago, believe me, my first year was at least the first few months were traumatic for how tough it was. And it, and, and there again, you know, uh, John Cochran who was became then my advisor and has become my my one of my best friends first of all encouraged me to persist and, and then I remember years later you know when you are a, a penniless PhD student who and you're not even sure you're gonna make it to the end of the month I received an offer from a bank I, I was not done with my PhD but I received an offer from a bank uh, back in Europe to work for the research department and I was so tempted to take it because you go like okay just imagine I, I will have my income and I remember once again John said listen you finish your PhD and your life will be so much more meaningful you'll be excited about what you'll do and you know I will always be grateful for that advice because that that definitely made a huge difference